from Wake Forest University, um, somebody who is an up-and-coming, um, rising um, environmental historian of Latin America, doing terrific work, um, primarily on Mexico um, and conservation issues going back into the 1930s, um, but has also worked on public parks as a project on climate. She's published on Chile and issues there. She spent um, lots of time in many different parts of, of Latin America. Um, the last time I saw her before today was actually in Peru last summer. Um, she'd just come out of leading her students at Wake Forest University on a trip into um, Manu National Park um, in Peru in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and for the students in History 336, she was actually at Turborg's cabin and his research station that we just read about on Monday. So um, we'll hear more about that tomorrow in class. Um, but we're, we're privileged to have her here bringing all this expertise on these different issues. Um, she uh, comes um, to Wake Forest University. She got her bachelor's degree at Willamette, a, a liberal arts college like here, um, but far away. Um, and then her PhD at the University of Arizona um, and continued to keep working on these, these various issues. She has a book that's coming out as well as these various articles and publications and that deals a lot more with these issues of conservation and national parks and um, Lazaro Cardenas in particular in the 1930s in Mexico and really looking at political, environmental, ecological, economic aspects of the history of parks and conservation. So it's a variety of issues that all come together and the, uh, the book is moving forward rapidly and hopefully we'll have it in our hands before, before too long. Um, so we're, we're privileged to have her here tonight. Um, she's going to talk um, a bit about these issues um, that, are, that she deals with in the book and focusing on this period in Mexico, a very pivotal era um, in the 1930s uh, when conservation really took off. And um, we, we'll see that it's a very different model than we think of national parks and conservation in the United States, um, the Mexico side. And so um, this is great for us to see that as well because we know and love our own park, so it's great to see how they develop in other parts of the world also. So, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, welcome, Professor Wakefield. Thank you, Mark, for that gracious introduction, and thank, um, thank you to Washington and Lee for having me here, and thank you all for turning out tonight. I hear I'm competing with Lincoln, so I'm, I'm encouraged and enlightened to see so many of you in the audience. Um, and I, I'm very excited to be here. What I'd like to talk to you about, as um, Professor Carey just pointed out, is about national parks in what I hope is a very unexpected way. And the main themes that I'd like to talk about tonight are really mutually reinforcing and, and interrelated, um, but they're, they're threefold. Um, the first is I'd like to talk a little bit about how parks are cultural artifacts. Right? We think of parks as, as, as natural, right, being spaces of nature, but they're also very cultural and they're artifacts of particular cultures. And in some ways they have universal appeal because of that. The second thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, how parks reveal social relationships with nature, um, and, and in that way, how they're comparable. Um, and finally, I'd like to uh, emphasize what Mexican parks tell us about these two previous things. And I believe that Mexicans par Mexican parks show us the importance of a connection between social change and conservation. So there's two examples from Mexico that I'll get to in just a little bit. Um, but in general, par parks are a popular thing. They're a, they're a popular idea. And when we think of national parks and nature reserves in general, usually what comes to mind is Yellowstone or Alaska, maybe even the Amazon. And a sprawling metropolis like Mexico City isn't usually what comes to mind. Um, but Less than 50 miles from this place is this one. And this is one of Mexico's earliest parks. And both these pictures I took in 2006. And it led me to ask, why, why is there such a juxtaposition? And what does it mean to have these two landscapes so intimately intertwined? And my hope is that in considering these ideas about conservation and the areas in which conservation unfolds, uh, by looking in these unexpected places, it can help us get right in our relationship with the non-human world and the places that we live. So what I'd like to tell you about is 
the very unlikely creation of 40 national parks in Mexico during the latter stages of what comes to be the, the social revolution, the first social revolution of the 20th century that took place roughly from 1910 to about 1940. And most of these 40 national parks were within one or two hours of Mexico City by car. The parks largely protected <coughs> temperate forests, not the tropical rainforest. And they overlapped with long-standing, historically rooted peasant communities in the highland volcanic plateau. So by 1940 then, national parks protected over 2 million acres in 14 of the Mexican states. And this part is usually shocking to people. By 1940, Mexico led the world in national parks in the number of national parks. And this is rare. Rarely have tropical countries or post-colonial countries had this ability or even the ambition to protect nature on a nationwide scale. So why did Mexico? Um, Mexico did because national parks were the outgrowth of the revolution. And they were the outgrowth of revolutionary affinities for rational science on the one hand and social justice on the other. So formally trained, scientifically rooted foresters and experts established parks in places that they thought were the most critical and they had determined were the most critical for restoring degraded forests around the nation's capital or protecting watersheds in that same area for agricultural development. Um, and, and also preserving symbolic landforms like these volcanoes. But at the same time, rural people lived in these landscapes and continued to inhabit them and use them for a whole range of activities from growing crops to producing charcoal. So because the Mexican Revolution was em um, embraced in this promise to land to the man who works it, pushing these residents off the land or prohibiting their activities was politically untenable and it wasn't possible. So sympathy for rural people tempered what might have been the radicalism of scientific conservationists in Mexico. But simultaneously, a concern for the degradation of the environment allowed defenders of the natural world to enter into national politics in a new way. So this might be the first vestiges of what later comes to be called sustainability. Right? and those interconnections. But this was much more than an idea. It was a tangible reality, and it was a reality that looked a lot like this. So as, as this map shows, this was a map produced in 1940, um, and the park distribution is um, apparent here on this map. You can see how reformers created so many parks in the uh, core of the country, the physical center, that they could hardly be displayed and get the entire national territory. So the inset map over to the top right is the area right around Mexico City. And it's a configuration or a conglomeration of power that's familiar to people that know Mexico. Like a, a sort of bullseye or a vacuum in the core of the country, Mexico City radiates power and economic activity. And it also boasted the largest and most densely settled population anywhere in the country. So it shouldn't be surprising then that the answer to my self-imposed question here, where are the parks, the parks are where the nation is or where the nation was. And the creation of the parks was an affirmation of that territory, not a colonization or a settlement of it. So parks emerge here so that citizens could use them and so that more people could use them. And visitor logs from the 1930s show that by 1938, more than 50,000 Mexicans were going to these parks every year. And the visitors included, the visitors uh, self-identified in these logs as what their occupations were. So there was everything from union workers and jewelers to picnicking families and, and even um, foreign travelers and visitors. Um, so what I'd like to do is set a context for this surge of parks in Mexico. And there's really two parts of that context. There's one that's national and there's one that's global. And I'd like to start with the global and then move more carefully into the national. 
Um, and, and this is where I emphasize the idea that national parks are comparable and they're worth comparing because that tells us a lot about the societies that create them. Um, so we know national parks are, are um, popular and they hold this cachet among scholars as well. There's more than a dozen different forms of protected areas that are internationally recognized um, and they conserve nature and protect different aspects of ecological systems. But the name National Park suggests more than that, right? It suggests they are overtly political, that they're symbols of state power on the landscape. And in the past 100 years, protected areas have gone from very rare, <coughs> scarce sites to common features everywhere in the world. Um, between 1900 and 1950, there were about 600 official naturally protected areas around the world. Between just 1950 and 1960, that doubled to over 1,000. And today, there's more than 110,000 natural protected areas and more are being added every day. So if we were to graph that, it would look like this, right? So this is a, 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 a quantitative, um, a, a striking visual quantitative um, graph of that creation of parks. The total area of parks is on the right and the number is on the left, but the um, the, the, the trajectory goes one direction, right? And there's a rapid increase in parks. And the, the problem with this striking um, data is that it hides the waxing and waning of cultural values within this. So this is all the parks in the world. Um, and this is uh, accumulated, this was not me that accumulated, I wish. Um, it's the International Union of the Conservation of Nature that keeps these statistics and it compiles this data. Um, so the global diffusion of this idea, the national park idea, is, is important to have as context. Um, but within that diffusion, there's really two main perspectives on the creation of parks. So the literature on national parks um, has two models. On the one hand, parks as a democratic model, and on the other hand, parks as a colonial model. And what I'd like to, what, what I believe is that Mexico and the Mexican case for parks adds a hybrid model that's somewhere in between <laughs> those two. And that hybrid model is revolutionary in many ways. So uh, to return to the democratic and the colonial models, people by and large have recognized that the park concept originated in the United States. And as it originated, it meant an oasis of wild and pristine nature created on the frontier um, as conservationists in the East um, uh, rose in popularity. And, and so most histories of national parks generally date the concept to the gazetting of Yosemite in 1864 or the founding of Yellowstone in 1872. So some classic images from those events, right? The railroads moving in to Yellowstone and um, John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt um, at Glacier Point in Yosemite. What's less well known is that the important fact that Yellowstone was a national park and was declared a national park because it couldn't be a state park. It was in colonial territory. It wasn't within a state when it was created. Um, but regardless, the United States government created national parks separate from urban areas. They were cited remote from large populations of people. They, and they were used as a, a cultural artifact to prove that although the US lacked the cultural heritage of Europe that stretched all the way back to antiquity, the nature that the US had and the wonders of that nature were on par with those ancient artifacts. Um, and so not surprisingly, scholars have treated national parks as examples of US exceptionality. There are signs of democratic innovation and evidence of a deep commitment to elevating the worthiness of wilderness. And certainly the foresight to conserve places like this and designate them part of the national patrimony was an exceptional thing to do. It marked an exceptional act. So subsequently, conservation has been viewed as a privilege, right? One that's available only for people who no longer rely on the natural world, the land, to provide them with daily sustenance. And only by leaving that land behind in this story do people realize its inherent value. And so in this way, parks are cultural products of affluence. They're 
artifacts of democratic governance and attributes of civilized societies. But other scholars, not surprisingly, have carefully challenged this idea and the idea that national parks spread democratic or other modern ideals. And these scholars claim that parks were actually another way to deepen colonial relationships. They were a way to exclude native people's access to crucial resources from forests to hunting grounds. And some of the, the best new work in this genre has titles like dispossessing the wilderness or imposing wilderness. And so um, um, you have an image here of uh, a Nez Perce woman inside Yellowstone and a, a commons land in Arusha National Park in Tanzania. For the United States, these scholars have largely shown government officials forcibly removed um, Blackfeet and Miwok peoples from inside the park and restricted their access to customary, customary resources. In Tanzania and in South Africa, more racialized policies of exclusion afforded large animals more uh, rights than the local inhabitants. So in some, these scholars point out that the park, of, park ideal overlooks the opinions and the actions of the poor, um, who at times have a much greater stake in the preservation of nature. So these criticisms portray parks as tools of dispossession, right? They have been wielded very capriciously by imperial actors and deprive locals of their livelihoods. Missing from these two polarized ends are insights from Latin America especially historical insights from Latin America that haven't entered into this, th this conversation. And Latin America is a place where colonial rule had long since dissipated by the time the national park idea arrived. And it's also a place where native peoples consistently insisted on a role in democratic governance through revolutions. Right? So it's a different context. And I would like that to take us to our national context within Mexico and help us think about why parks that were neither colonial on the one hand or affluent and modern on the other happened in Mexico. Um, and that's the social and cultural relationship that's revealed for, for Mexico. So um, to back up to the 1930s then, a unique set of circumstances unfolded in Mexico with the first social revolution of the 20th century. And this set of circumstances fostered a, within a framework of social change ideas about environmental protection. And these help us think about national parks globally. In particular, the government in Mexico borrowed this foreign idea, right? They borrowed the template for national parks that excluded na local residents, and they reformulated it and changed it to fit their social context and their own goals, which were largely to include people in the government and not exclude them from it. And so the ethic that came out was designed by federal foresters, but it was contested and shaped by local people um, who insisted on playing a role because they'd been affirmed by their revolution. So this ethic upheld the centrality of the idea of common property, which was central to the Mexican Revolution. And it promoted a shared idea of national culture, of revolutionary culture. Um, and in part, this also articulated the responsibility of the government to protect the public inheritance, not just individuals. And it also raised popular respect and concern for nat natural spaces. And so the result delicately balanced these national parks in the core of the country. How this happened is a, is a lot longer story, right? And support for scientific conservation and the, the, the burgeoning ideas within Mexico um, had origins in the late 19th century. This was the period where foreign capital came in and paid for the construction of railroads and factories within Mexico, and also the time when resident scientists began to notice changes in their climate as hillsides were cleared to build railroads and, um, and to extract those resources. So in this way, there's a, there's a striking similarity with the U.S. trajectory of conservation. Uh, and various steps are taken within Mexico to uh, 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 conserve 
resources, then these in start with forests. In, in 1898, there's the first designation of a forest protection area, and this surrounded the mining concessions in um, El Chico Hidalgo, just north of Mexico City, and that area later became a national park. There's numerous um, uh, reforestation projects that take place um, in uh, the wetlands of Veracruz, and there's also reforestation on eroded hills around major cities nationwide. And at this time, the conservation advocates were largely engineers. They were foreign trained, and they were familiar with the ideas within the United States about national parks, and also with the burgeoning forestry management objectives that came out of Europe at the same time. But something happened to interrupt this trajectory. And what happened was in 1910, these efforts were interrupted by the revolution. And historians have always been drawn to the Mexican Revolution. And usually we get out of it heroic pictures like this one of Pancho Villa, of stoic rural people that are defending their land and, um, and their country. But these same historians have been slow to notice how each major piece of legislation that came out of the Mexican Revolution also held with it a recognition of the natural world. So that is to say, for every image like this, we can often want, find one more like this um, that went alongside it. People looking over the lake in a new national park. So slowly, even though the, the revolution interrupted the progress of conservation, slowly and piece by piece, components were put into place to um, allow a national conservation system to develop. And the first national park was declared in, by President Carranza in 1917, and it was declared on the lands of what had been a Carmelite monastery inside Mexico City um, that's surrounded by forests. In that very same year, revolutionaries compromised on a new constitution, <coughs> and within that constitution, they, they legislated their plans for social reform, including very radical provisions for socialist education, for labor unions and worker protections, but especially for natural resource management. So this included the largest agrarian reform project that has occurred in Latin America and a template for petroleum expropriation. So within this broader constitution <laughs> were plans for parks all along. And as revolutionary fighting turned to political stability, conservation advocates were able to put these policy pieces in place and a number of external pieces appeared. The Forestry Code of 1926, for example, and the Six-Year Plan from 1934 to 1940 all included provisions to create national parks. And they all um, espoused the idea that conservation should be a corollary to modernization and development. So this broad series of firsts included parks and reserves, and it included laws and codes, and really a developing scientific community that cultivated public opinion towards conservation. And as these necessary components accumulated over time, it um, took the right leadership to take them to a new level, right? To embark on a full-scale program to conserve nature and to create a network of national parks. And this leadership found a distinct cadence with President Lazaro Cardenas, who was president from 1934 to 1940. And Cardenas is pictured here in the middle of this picture, the man in the suit. And in the backdrop is the national park, um, El Tepozteco. Uh, so Cardenas guided the first set of national parks in Mexico to life. And he, there were 40 of them that he created in total. And although the parks had a relatively small average size, they were about 15,000 acres each, um, they were located in close proximity to the capital city, as we've already seen. Um, and in addition to just declaring the parks, Cardenas created an entire administrative apparatus to support them. The most important piece of this was the Department of Forestry, Fish, and Game that had an entire matrix for designing and administering the parks according to biological principles that were current at the time. 
And so by design, the parks complemented other land uses. They complemented farming and ranching by sheltering the water sources that fed those other activities. And they also cultivated forests to help stall erosion on agricultural plots. So rather, be, rather than being hostile or separate from social investments of the Cardenas period, conservation areas were very closely in tune to the platform of social development called for by the Constitution. And this platform tried to take rural people as the template for development and incorporate the masses into society um, as never before. The visual manifestation of this, I'm not sure how well you can see that with this light on, but um, the visual manifestation of this appeared in many places. This is the cover of a federal production, um, a federal publication that um, portrays this tapestry of development, as it were. Um, the, the tapestry reaches fullest potential under President Cardenas, and it really captures this harmonious vision of a landscape where all of the pieces work together. So we can see the object of this planning holding up the, the, the plan, the template, right? The, the uh, sandal-clad, um, overly large grinning um, peasant man looking at the, the plan and the volcanic landscape in the backdrop, and then on the sides, the preternaturally large sheaves of wheat and the corn kind of reaching at it. But within this tapestry, we can see this social development vision unfolding. Um, the, the revolution brought legislation that allowed reformers to organize producers' cooperatives and campesino or peasant unions and rural schools throughout the countryside. But revolutionaries also resurrected, somewhat haphazardly, a pre-Columbian pattern of land tenure, which was a form of community property known as an ejido. And that's what we see clustered in the middle of this image. These were neatly stitched land reform plots that were um, developed across the country. And these ejidos were supported then by pastures for livestock um, on their sides and intermittent irrigation works, particularly in arid landscapes, and protected reserves of forests, which are the, the pink on the top left. Um, and within this design, a small village held the center of the tapestry with a new school and a museum and a road. And within that, the residents were embedded in this natural productivity in the plan. But the most delicate areas with distinctive features that are also part of this are um, embroidered up in the, on the top right, and those were the national parks. So they were one component of this much broader social vision for what the landscape would be. And parks became then sanctuaries, perpetuating economic plans for production, but also furthering political goals to keep rural people rooted in this landscape. So what I'd like to do now is take a look at two parts that highlight some of these ideas. Um, and this will take us to the, the idea that parks show us where social change or ideas about justice connected with environmental conservation. This is an image from Cardenas' first park that he declared in 1935, which um, is an example of how conservation and use coexisted most dynamically. And at its heart, this national park preserves these two volcanoes, Ichasiwato and Popocatapeto. Um, which I can teach you to say later if you want. <laughs> um, and these two magnificent volcanoes are striking, but they're also s symbolic. They're the fifth and seventh highest peaks in North America, and they're covered by permanent or almost permanent glaciers. Um, and their history is also very deep. When the Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortez marched from Veracruz towards the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. He walked between these two volcanoes, and that pass is still called the Cortez Pass. Um, other famous Latin American figures have remarked on the volcanoes. The Argentine revolutionary Che Guevara came to the volcanoes when he was in Mexico City in 1954, and he climbed to the top of the crater of Popo, which is the volcano that's smoking in this, in this um, 
in this image, and as he described it in his journal, he was able to peer into the entrails of Mother Earth there on the volcano. Um, and Carlos Fuentes, the novelist and social commentator of Mexico, has remarked that through the 1970s, these two volcanoes were constant friends as part of the horizon and skyline of Mexico City, and they were always apparent there. So the, the social prestige of this region um, gave it a hefty national symbolism, but the landscape itself vibrated with daily activity, both using and conserving this valuable real estate. And um, on its highest flanks, on the eastern side, there was a meaty industrial carcass of a wood-based, Mexico's first wood-based paper, paper pulp mill, um, which was started in 1890. And this picture is a little fuzzy, but the juxtaposition of San Rafael, the paper company, and the Smoking Mountain, I think, blends well the dual purposes of this landscape. Um, the, by 1936, the paper factory here employed over a thousand residents in the area, ranging from mechanics and electrical operators to paper processors. Uh, and the forestry department gave special concessions to this company, which included the permission to extract at a certain level in and near the park. But a variety of other economic activities that took place there as well. These included more um, uh, small-scale enterprises like firewood collection or resin um, collecting and um, the processing of charcoal. And I point out these activities not to prove that conservation had loopholes in it, but precisely the opposite, to demonstrate that this was a different sort of conservation that was hashed out in these parks. These activities became regulated in new ways, but they were not forced to close down, or, nor were they allowed to proceed as usual once the park was there. So for the paper mill, Cardenas proposed a solution in keeping with his practice of statecraft and, and um, increasing the size of the government. So he designed an entity that would be able to insert the federal government in the core workings of the paper production industry while still leaving the business in private hands. So he created the Production and Importation of Paper Board, or PIPSA, which regulated paper producers and set prices for paper. And so, so this regulation allowed paper companies domestically to expand but they also kept foreign paper out of Mexico by imposing stiff tariffs. Uh, but most of the economic activity was not industrial, and was not of an industrial scale. Um, some of the residents first objected to the idea of a national park because they thought it would impede their livelihoods and restrict them from what they were already doing. And President Cardenas responded after a, about a year of some of these complaints coming with a solution. And he responded by allowing certain residents, those that could be defined as truly destitute, permission to continue harvesting their products in the park on a very small scale. So in 1937, Cardenas issued a presidential decree that modified the park regulations and the forestry code in three different ways. Uh, Cardenas authorized permit-free and tax-free production for any campesinos or peasant residents um, who geared their production for local consumption, for a local market, and weren't, weren't selling it all over the country. Uh, the second uh, change, modification, was he allowed free exploitation for only people who were truly destitute. If you were a member of a cooperative, or you worked for the paper company, or you had another source of employment, then you were not included in this, um, in this modification. And third, the decree strictly prohibited and punished the resale of any of the production that took place by these campesinos. So it tried to avoid the, um, the, the interference of intermediaries in these transactions. And 
These reforms really made the conservation restrictions more flexible by creating an exception for people that were already living there. But on the other hand, they remained heedful of conservation. So a road to the park was developed, and um, this was the first sign that was placed at the entrance. So these exceptions proved astute because they gave the residents in the area a reason to stop protesting a national park in their backyard and instead start supervising the forest. And so in places this led to a defense of national parks in order to defend community rights. So um, let me give you one example of this. Uh, um, a resident of the town closest to the national park, Asuncion Juarez, um, was a somewhat gregarious member of the community of Santiago Guatenco which was near the park, and he supported the exceptions um, that he saw in, coming down from Cardenas. He suspected that it would be a way to avoid corruption, and he saw it as a, a mechanism for defending the conservation in the park and his own livelihoods. And we know this because Juarez wrote a series of letters denouncing another community member, um, Loreto Rodriguez, uh, who was a resident of the same community who had produced charcoal on a large scale of very um, uh, of amounts um, that were prodigious and this large-scale production um, uh, alerted Juarez to the violation and in response Rodriguez offered to share half the profit with him if he didn't turn him in and Rodriguez claimed that the the woods that he had made the charcoal out of were his own that there had been a land transfer transaction and he actually owned those forests Juarez aggressively denied this fact and understanding the park decree and the new exceptions um, he he uh, proved that there was no record of this transaction because there was impossible to be it was impossible for Rodriguez to have that land because the and he said um, because part of the forest in reference belongs to the federal government and forms part of the national park of the volcanoes and in his long defense Juarez speaks to an acceptance or at least a tolerance of the park because he saw federal property as an extension of community authority and a means to denounce violators of village norms. So at its heart then, the, the uh, approach to resource management sought to maintain national landscapes that provo promoted sustainable or small-scale enterprises. And by creating this park, the federal government became an intermediary between, on the one hand, large industrialists that had had free access to all the resource they wanted before the revolution, and on the other hand, small-scale users. And the federal government treated them very similarly. Evicting either group or cutting off their use of the park lands was politically infeasible and also undesirable because both groups held considerable political clout. So instead, the mechanism became a way to bring these various constituencies into the federal fold, part of the state, and mitigate the conflict that might arise between them and increase the supervision of their activities overall. And this made the Ichtasiwato Popocatapetl Park a showplace for revolutionary ideology, not just for the nature that it had inside, but Tepotzlan is a different sort of national park that can give us another slice of uh, the picture of parks in Mexico. Um, it's a, a different kind of cultural artifact in that Tepotzlan was a classic village, and it was a village full of conservationists. And this village was not so different, as you can see from this image, from many other pueblos in, in Mexico. Uh, it, this one in particular is located about 60 miles south of Mexico City and about 15 miles from the state capital of Cuernavaca. The altitude of this village um, was at range. The, the municipality stretched from 10,000 feet down to about 3,500 feet, which created a very large array of ecosystems within this one municipality. And um, the 
the municipality was named Tepotzlan, as was the largest of the seven villages that were in that municipality, and President Cardenas declared the entire municipality a national park. Um, it had a stable population of about 3,000 people when he did so, and the majority of the population were Nahuatl-speaking Indians. It had been a locus for Zapatista fighting during the revolution, and people that had moved away had begun to come back. And although most villagers were engaged in some sort of agriculture, in the 1920s and 30s, a burgeoning um, forestry enterprise um, developed, in particular tied to uh, the first uh, forestry cooperative in the state that was um, started in the late 1920s. So community politics in the early 1930s began to revolve around the issue of scarcity in the forests and whether or not to conserve and to slow down the production of charcoal to make sure the, far the forests were conserved or to make the profit over them now. And with the creation of the national park, on top of these um, domestic, or on top of these village-level conflicts, federal reformers began to recognize how rural traditions were a component of a shared national identity that could be celebrated with the parks. And one way this happened was when Cardenas visited the village in 1935. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that visit to show how it highlights some of these issues. Um, Cardenas was um, renowned for visiting far places, and he traveled more than any president up until his time, I think 26,000 miles or so while he was in office. And, um, he was known for visiting vi villages, and he did so often on a whim. And so he got his brother on the mor morning of um, March 23, 1935, and they took the train with a few officials and decided to visit Tepotzlan. And when Cardenas arrived at the local railway stop, the hosts in the village sprung into action um, uh, with their guests. Because there was no road to the village from the railroad stop, Cardenas and his brother and, and their entourage began the descent into the village from um, the same rocky ravine that took that was um, two kilometers in length that the residents took to the to the railroad station. Excuse me, um, but the excited residents didn't whisk him quickly down to the village. Instead, they took him on an immediate detour through the mountains, and they stopped at the site of a legendary pre-Columbian pyramid. And this Colum this pyramid had been unearthed by archaeologists in 1895, and it contained this um, this it's sort of a a, a carcass here, but it contained a stone temple honoring a Tepoztecan deity. And positioned on the top of the steep stairs and surrounded by several generations of Tepoztecan men clamoring to be near him, Cardenas posed for this picture, um, which uh, isn't great in its quality, um, while his brother sat among the villagers on the bottom. So. Um, Cardenas is standing in the suit on the top right, and his brother, who looks just like him, is seated there in the front. Um, so after uh, the excursion to the pyramid, um, the villagers kind of scrambled to impress him in other ways, and many of them apologized for the humble sausage bread that they had to offer him, and they promised a much more elaborate dinner and fireworks when he got down to the village for dinner. Um, but next, after the pyramid, the and cameras, pyramids, and fireworks have an interplay between a traditional village and traditional symbols and a modern park. And these tensions tugged increasingly at each other in the 1930s. The road station had been developed in the 19th century expansion, and it brought the world closer and closer to this remote village, although access to it still demanded that physical labor 
through the ravine. But on the other hand, outsiders, from politicians to anthropologists, came to this town for its quaint qualities and its really persistent indigenousness. Um, it's one of thousands of villages that face similar tensions such as these. And outsiders utilize Temple's Lawn to demonstrate a village in transition at this point, and transition between traditional and modern life. No fewer than 12 anthropologists have studied this village in the 20th century. It's been studied and restudied and reworked uh, numerous times for these very And these tensions have another unexpected dimension to them. Um, in four different ways the, that we begin to glimpse at with Cardinal's excursion, Temple Lawn and its part represent how environmental concerns shaped identity at the local level and also at the national level. First, Temple Lawn received a disproportionate amount of outside attention from the president visiting to academics and artists that retired there. And so it developed this status as a classic village that made it symbolic and created this idea of an archetypal community that demonstrated both change and continuity. And this notoriety made Temple Lawn exceptional. At the very same time, it was demonstrating how ordinary the village was. Um, the location of Temple Lawn in the Central Valley's forests and its contents, the pre-Columbian pyramid and the Dominican convent, highlighted the fusion of spiritual spaces on the one hand and na the natural world on the other, just like this photograph does. These are the spires on the Dominican convent and the ridge line in the back. So a, natural a national park here then represented the sacredness of the place that layered history with nature, not any sort of imagined wilderness that separated them or divorced them. Um, third, local struggles over use and conservation in Temple Lawn demonstrate how resource decisions never belong only in the federal domain or to outside federal foresters. In fact, deciding how to use the communal forest became the axis upon which local politics orbited. And this sort of ecological consciousness, or the sense that local residents deserved to say and how the resources got used, persisted in Temple Lawn through the 20th century. So this same community refused a funicular tramway that was scheduled to go to the top of the ridge in the 1970s. And the same community came together in the 1990s to refuse a Jack Nicholas golf course uh, on community territory. And finally, Temple Lawn captured national tensions over this transition between traditional society and a modern nation. So the people that made up the majority of Temple Lawn, indigenous people, became this revered symbol of the revolution. At the same time, they demanded resource rights, or rights to their resource wealth. So I want to offer a couple quick concluding ideas and then um, hopefully take some of your questions. Um, at no point since the 1930s tried to conserve the forests or build national parks in the way that it did. And between the 1940s and the 1980s, Mexico underwent what's been called the Mexican miracle, right? And it was this enormous industrial expansion and economic growth um, that took place largely at the expense of the environment, and the results were staggering. They look sort of like this view taken from a national park outside, looking down into Mexico City. Mexico went from being a country in 1950 with 26 million people to at the end of the century being one with more than 100 million. And at the same time, this miracle increased humanity. It also amplified the pressures on natural resources that were necessary to sustain such growth. So in this period, parks lost their funding, soils were eroded or <coughs> were poisoned, developers tapped aquifers to new levels, and the air, as you can see, became too toxic to breathe. And gradually, Cardenas's political heirs strangled the last vestiges of revolutionary democracy at the same time that the institutionalized revolutionary party became this visible environmental catastrophe. But the park idea resurged in Mexico 
Uh, by the 1980s, which were also this intense period of social and economic restructuring, federal bureaucrats turned again to conser conserving nature. And this was part of their broad plan for reorganizing ownership and production and labor under the, the guise of neoliberalism. So these new sites of natural value lay very far from the temperate forests in the core of the country. They were the coral reefs in the south or the gray well habitats in the north, the tropical forests. And in this new type of conservation, hippies and hikers and college students and retirees and even resort goers became the focus for conservation and they replaced peasants and workers and foresters as the main constituents. Um, and in this way, they, um, they provided a green stamp and left behind the revolutionary conservation history. So um, what I'd like to leave you with then is this idea that revolutionary environmentalism in Mexico challenged the assumption that the capacity to conserve correlates in any way to economic development or scientific sophistication. So in contrast to dem democratic pop, uh, participation before the revolution in the 1930s, attention to social justice flourished. This included land reform and expressions of indigenous cultural inheritance. But it's no accident that environmental protection, nature's justice, was also embedded in that broad swath of social policies. So where the parks are says much about where the cultural values that produce them come from. Thank you. That sounds great. Thanks. Okay. I'll throw one out. I, great. Several, before you ever mentioned the Aquilo, I was thinking about, mm -hmm. since you're thinking about possession and death possession, but yeah. Several times as I listened, I, I, I changed my mind about what you're saying. So I want to go back and see okay. if, I, if, if this mm -hmm. is an apple synthesis. On the, it seems like on the one hand that mm -hmm. we can say that there is a direct antithesis between the rise, birth, death, if you will, of the national parks and its correlation with the Aquilos. Now, I'm thinking back to that first graph yeah. that you showed. Mm -hmm. and, if, and trying to put it in you know, a simple phrase, is it correct to say that with post-revolutionary modernity, we have the setting aside of parks, but at the same time, as we move into agro-industry, free trade, NAFTA, that very same thing is sort of the death of the ejido in northern Mexico. Is that a fair conclusion? I mean, is that one thing we can extrapolate from your research? Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't done the, um, the, the exact correlation to see how that works, but I do think that that's, that's, that's accurate. Um, we do see, I mean, both of those are attempts at social justice, right, or making right with land policy. And you're right, they're both abandoned by this miracle, right, by the, by the agro-industrial shift in the 1940s. Um, there are interesting correlations, and one of the archives I worked the most in was the National Agrarian Archive. And so there are a lot of um, relationships between ejidos and parks, and there's, to this day, still parks that are run by ejidos. So um, Nevado de Toluca on the west side of the, the Valley of Mexico is managed by an ejido. They, they charge a fee at the beginning and they oversee a lot of it, even though it's still federal territory. So the relationship between the ejido and the park is different in each of the sites and it really locally uh, contextualized. But I think on a broad scale, there is a symbiotic relationship with the intention, especially the policy intention for two of them. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Um, you talked about how they were uh, destitute of individual sites where they mm -hmm. gathered stuff in the parks and how they were like a, a logging company. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and it's, it's one that's really difficult to answer <laughs> because the, the studies of how those landscapes have changed haven't been done on a large basis, and I don't have the, 
scientific tools to do that, although I do have, with some of these flyover images, some ideas on, on how I can do that in the future. So I have some photographic evidence of the park starting in the 1930s and going up through the 1980s, so I might be able to answer what I think you're asking is, did they conserve nature? at all, right? Did they protect these forests in any way from either the loggers or, or the people living in them? Um, and I think that even in um, a picture like this, you can look at the forests, right? This is within the National Park um, Ahusco, and you can see they're still there, right? There is something there. This development and this urban stain, as it's often called, didn't reach there yet. And so something's still there. Is it a, um, a pristine wilderness that allows the native species to flourish there? No, I'd be hard pressed to argue that. But something's still there. Um, and uh, how it's changed, I think, as you point out, is, a, is an important question. Thank you. Yeah. My question is related to that mm -hmm. one. Yeah, and certainly this new, uh, since the 1980s, the, the efforts have been made, the um, Protection Area Administration has shifted around quite a bit. So it's out of the Department of Agriculture and it's in its own entity now. So some of those debates have happened in recent years in Mexico. Um, but as you point out, what's interesting is that when the Park Service and the Forest Service were formed in the United States, they fought with each other, right? They had, the, they had arguments about what their, um, their institutional objectives were and how they fit together. And within Mexico, those were in the same department. And so the policy was more unified, and it was um, uh, the idea of having the parks embedded and part of this larger system um, was very organic in that way. It, they weren't seen as separate and administered somewhere else. They were within the same entity that was regulating forest reserves and those things. And I think in that way, they were able to um, manage for a broader ecosystem, which is where large conservation areas point to now. The problem with Mexico is that they, they turned the other direction in the 1940s. So we don't have a record of what might have happened had that, co, um, uh, that, that coordinated management been allowed to proceed um, because there's virtually no creation and, and the funding drops out really in the middle. So the best they can do with these parks is really hold steady. Um, and, and that's sort of what happens. I don't know if that got to where you were going with it. Yeah, but there have been a number of changes, and largely they've come because of the surge of different types of protected areas that, as conservation biology developed as a science, evaluated Mexico and said, this is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. You should protect all these other things that the Mexican government and largely the nation around the core of Mexico City didn't find valuable earlier. And so the science framework internationally allowed for this expansion to happen, um, especially on these um, frontier and, and um, largely peripheral areas from the framework of national policymakers. Um, and, and I think that that's, in a large way, a good thing. It's conserved more territory in a very particular places, um, but it hasn't resonated with the earlier era and the especially social justice concerns and concerns with keeping people on the land and employed productively in that land so they'd care for the parks. So that part of it's been lost. Questions? Can I ask you a, sure. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to grapple with in my class and mm -hmm. I've been grappling with for a long time is this issue of local access versus Mm -hmm. the good of humanity or something. And I guess I'm just curious, you, you framed this as there's the colonial model of parks which pushes people out mm -hmm. and evicts them to save that. And my assumption is that you think that this hybrid model that you're proposing, that this Mexican idea of allowing local access is good. Why, then I'll have to ask this in kind of a flip way, 
why do locals get privilege over to that land instead of the good of the humanity? Shouldn't we be saving yeah. nature and saving these parks and saving places for everybody, not just the local residents who just happen to live there? So why are you, yeah. are you and why are you privileging that local access model? That's a great question. Um, and, and I have some kind of subjective criteria for that. Um, I think w one reason why local inhabitants can and, and should be privileged in um, central Mexico is because that land has been inhabited and used for millennia, right, or at least many, many centuries. And that inhabitants has configured the landscape in a particular way that sustained it over all of this time. And so a lot of the ejidos and uh, the communities around these parks trace their land grants back to the King of Spain, if not before. And so they claim perpetual right to that land, and I think that that depth of a historical presence on that land gives them a different right than someone that moved there 50 years ago or five years ago. Um, and, and I think that that historical depth in many ways speaks to their capacity for stewardship and custodianship of that land. So how much of that uh, landscape that we know is because of that inhabitants? And, and would kicking them out give us something different entirely? And, and I think that that's problematic. And then the, the um, so uh, that's why I think local in this context does deserve something better. The other side of that is that we're dealing here with temperate forests that are, um, uh, species depauperate compared to the tropics, right? And the, the um, existence of different, um, while still important, species on this area have also been well trammeled over the years. And so if the, um, uh, if mammals were going to go extinct in this area, they're, they're already there. And so it's not equivalent to moving into an area, area I think, where um, um, uh, thousands of species would disappear um, in that in that sense. So I think the, um, the the content of the landscapes that have been lived in this way also um, makes a difference. 